ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಅಂಡ್ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಐ ಸಿ ಟಾಕ್ಸ್ ಅ ಪಾಡ್ಕಾಸ್ಟ್ ಬೈ ಬ್ಯಾಂಗ್ಲೋರ್ ಇಂಟರ್ನ್ಯಾಷನಲ್ ಸೆಂಟರ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಆಸ್ ಇಫ್ ಇಂಡಿಯನ್ಸ್ ವರ್ ಟೋಟಲಿ ಆಫ್ ಆಲ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ರೇಡಿಯೋ ಆಸ್ ಇಟ್ ವರ್ or didn't engage with it. So, for example, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, Sarojini Naidu, and Amrit Kaur, for example, um, before the Second World War, were broadcasting on economic and social issues on All India Radio. Of course, Rabindranath Tagore very famously embraced uh, radio. And in fact, when the short wave station was established in Calcutta it was Tagore who wrote a poem called Akash Vani to celebrate this event you just heard historian Chandrika Kaul giving us a valuable bit of information on the beginnings of All India Radio or Akash Vani as many of us know it This episode of BIC Talks has the former CEO of Prasad Bharti, Jawhar Sarkar, in conversation with Chandrika Kaul, following her lecture that will focus on Gandhi and radio, a subject that has been curiously neglected both in studies of Gandhi and of broadcasting. Gandhi's engagement with radio, the circumstances surrounding his broadcasts, and his interaction with broadcasters will be analyzed to help situate the medium within the mahatma's media repertoire and evaluate its impact and now over to jahar good evening friends it's my pleasure and my honor to be stimulating a discussion saying a couple of words about radio and chandrika call Now Chandrika Kaul as you'll see from her bio teaches at St Andrews University in Scotland and has been avidly doing her work research on the media focusing at times on the Indian media in the imperial era or the early post independence period now she's done a lot of work and groundwork and i commend her because this subject is devastated by the lack of proper records the imperial archives or the national archives of india today still do not have too much on it i know because i have tried to find out a lot and xerox so xerox to bits so this institution has not been able to preserve too much of this the period in which uh, chandrika has worked there are some writings but chandrika has actually filled in a large gap and this gap relates to gandhi and the media not just the indian media in the ta- in terms of radio and the print media there was no television at that time but gandhi and media now gandhi's crafting of his own narrative which becomes a national narrative has been discussed many a time how he led the narrative on and we have a lot of work but with the specific topic of gandhi how he related to the media name or here how he related to the radio setup all india radio there has been very little work in fact one or two among the pieces that i have read is on his pinkertons zinta there are some work but they have the different focus now i won't stand between you and chandrika but i would request chandrika to sort of uh, fashion the talk on three pillars first of all gandhi's first adre- address on radio which was to the american radio it was conducted by both uh, chicago herald and associated press from london he was tackling a completely new medium on september 13th i think uh, 1931 radio in india was floundering at that time so 31 means that the radio in britain and america were uh, quite ahead so that's the first address how he dealt with it the second address was again in september but 1947 just after independence when severe riots had broken out all over punjab 
and refugees had poured into Kurukshetra and Gandhi had decided to pacify them. He was stopped at the border, he was stopped at Delhi's border, told not to proceed and instead he decided to come to All India Radio for the first time in his life. So this, these two are the pillars. And third, while he's, she's talking about it, she could as well think of giving us a pen picture of how the radio functioned during that period. I mean, the radio was still in its various stages of infancy and childhood. It would become a very powerful weapon in Europe by the mid thirties, when the Nazis started using it, when Churchill realized its great importance. But in India, it was still, I would put it a football being tossed by a very independent controller and his successors and the Imperial Raj. In other words, between the professionals of All India Radio and the bureaucrats of the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, whom I had the pleasure of being dealt rather unfairly. So between the bureaucrats on the one hand and between the professionals on the other, they did produce a lot of material for history. So Chandrika's book, which she has edited, deals mainly on this subject. And Chandrika's own chapter on it focuses on Gandhi. Now over to you, Chandrika. Thank you very much. Namaskar and good evening to everyone in India. It's such a delight to be here. And thank you to the Bangalore International Center and to Johar for so kindly hosting this talk. I'm going to adhere to Johar's request and speak for about, you know, 25 minutes or so, broadly along the lines of what he said, i.e. focusing on Gandhi's own contributions and interaction with radio. However, in my work and in this book that Jawhar mentioned, which has just been published, I do talk about the development of all India radio in the 20s, 30s and 40s. So I hope to touch upon that, but I won't focus on that in my talk, but perhaps I could get back to some of the details um, in the post-lecture discussion. So, as I think everybody knows, Gandhi was a, a master publicist. We have had numerous biographers who have attested to his skills at using media. But it is very interesting and striking that when it comes to broadcasting and radio, he only ever made two live broadcasts, one in September 1931 and the second in November 1947, and Dohar has touched on both of them. But how do we explain this anomaly? And why is it that Gandhi chose not to engage much more? It's not as if Indians were totally of All India Radio, as it were, or didn't engage with it. So, for example, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, Sarojini Naidu, and Amrit Kaur, for example, um, before the Second World War, were broadcasting on economic and social issues on All India Radio. Of course, Rabindranath Tagore very famously embraced uh, radio, and in fact, when the shortwave station was established in Calcutta, it was Tagore who wrote a poem called Akash Vani to celebrate this event. And of course, that was then adopted as the formal title uh, by, by, the, by the Indians after independence to refer to broadcasting. And of course, during the Second World War, we do have um, most dramatically, Subhas Chandra Bose, who was broadcasting, albeit from uh, Germany to India, but nevertheless using the medium. And during the Quit India uh, Revolution in 1942, we also had a very short-lived clandestine 
Congress radio network that was broadcasting. So going back to Gandhi, in the 19, late 1920s, when All India Radio, but it wasn't called All India Radio then, it was called the Indian Broadcasting Company, was established, Gandhi did interact with the British controller, a chap called Eric Dunstan. He met him in Bombay and, and seemingly had discussions about uh, radio. But we don't have evidence of any further development uh, based on this interest of Gandhi's. And it's only in 1931 when Gandhi comes to London to attend the second roundtable conference that he is persuaded by his American journalist friends, I should say, but those who were following him, for example, people like William Shirer, who represented the Chicago Herald Tribune and covered Gandhi's uh, no civil disobedience movement, or Jim Mills, who represented uh, news agencies, again, American news agencies, and covered um, aspects of the civil disobedience movement in 1930. It was because Gandhi had this relationship with American journalists, that when he reached London, he was persuaded uh, to make his first ever live broadcast to, to America. And this happened in 1931, in September, on the 13th to be precise. And it is very interesting, and I write in detail about how Gandhi, um, you know, accepted this invitation and then how he engaged with the medium. You know, he comes in five minutes late. People are biting their nails because this is live radio. But he walks in calmly five minutes um, after the scheduled time, sits down, and then without realizing that the mic was live, he makes that remark, do I speak? into this thing. So that is the first uh, sentence that his audience, particularly in America, ever hear of Gandhi. And it's very interesting because afterwards, you know, there are lots of letters that arrive in London from America talking about, about the broadcast. But, but before I come to that, so, so basically, what does Gandhi say? Now, it's very interesting. Gandhi, as is well known, doesn't speak from written notes. He's usually extempore. And so he is on this first broadcast too. He sits down, composes himself, and then talk beautifully and evocatively about the movement for independence in India. But what I found really interesting in this first broadcast that he gave was the use repeatedly of the word world globe, uh, you know, the idea, uh, and he says it, that what we or the Indians and he is looking for is the support of the world in India's struggle. So it is absolutely clear that he is focusing on the creation, if you like, of a global message. And in turn, he himself is becoming this global Gandhi. Now, of course, this broadcast is not the first time he does this. He does this during the Salt March in 1930. And again, I've written about that as well, and particularly about the impact of that Salt March in the West, in America and in London. So Gandhi is very aware that there is a backdrop to this. He is speaking to, if you like, friends, those who he feels are on his side and on the side of the movement he is trying to wage in India. So he is speaking to the converted. And I think this is reflected in his confidence in the way he articulates his message on, um, on the radio on this occasion. Now, briefly, it is, um, you know, for its time, very successful. And I base this on fact, on very, you know, I won't go into the detail, but essentially newspapers reproduce the, um, the, the, the speech verbatim. His secretary, Mahadev Desai, writes about how every week the mailbox is 
inundated by letters, you know, from America. And so there is plenty of um, evidence, both written from the media and also some anecdotal evidence that Gandhi's broadcast is successful. Now, very briefly, what happens when Gandhi goes back to India? Well, essentially what's happening in India in the second half of the 1930s is that the government has now taken over broadcasting. And in 1935, we have the birth of the so-called All India Radio, as it's then christened. And the person who's put in charge of this is a former BBC employee, a chap called Lionel Fielden. And I write in my work about the relationship between Fielden and Gandhi and how over the next few years, Fielden tries but fails to persuade Gandhi to use the medium. And I think I will, in the conclusion, I will go through why I think uh, Gandhi doesn't, particularly because, as I mentioned earlier, people like Nehru, Sarojini Naidu and others at this time in the late 30s, do use the medium. But it is quite interesting because Fielden himself is very sympathetic to the nationalist cause. But of course, as the controller of All India Radio, he cannot take sides. But he is very aware that the government of India, the British Raj, technically, theoretically, talks about the freedom of the airwaves but in actual fact, puts in so many regulations that effectively there is no political access to the airwaves for Indians. So even after the, the 1935 Government of India Act, which in, interestingly has a section uh, for the first time on communications and on broadcasting. But it makes it very clear that the way the airwaves are not to be used for political messaging, political propaganda. So in 1937, when the Congress and other and the League and other you know, Indian parties are engaging in electioneering, if you like, they are not allowed to use the airwaves. Now, in the 1940s, during the war, of course, again, very briefly, there is a, a huge resurgence of the government's interest in developing All India Radio, as well as the BBC broadcasts to India. I'm working on a different book on these issues. So I think what I can say at this point is that there is a great deal of money put into it, obviously for war propaganda reasons, and particularly after 1942, when, of course, the threat from Japan is so uh, insistent and is so worrying. But of course, as we all know, in 1942, we have the Quit India Movement, and for two years, at least Gandhi for two years, is imprisoned, he's released in 44, but most of the other leaders are not. So even if they wanted to, they simply couldn't access the airwaves, apart from Subhash Bose and others I mentioned earlier. So after the war, when the writing is on the wall, as it were, for the Raj, we begin to see a change when it comes to broadcasting too. But Gandhi is not willing, even at this stage, to engage with the medium. When Lord Mountbatten finally uh, comes in as the last viceroy in 1947, we begin to see a very dramatic difference in the engagement of more political or more Indian politicians, if you like, directly with radio. And the reasons for this are complex. I've written about it elsewhere. It's partly to do with the fact that the British know they're leaving. It's partly to do with the fact that Mountbatten himself is very keen on publicity, on propaganda, and on using the media, particularly for projecting his own image. Uh, but also, I think he feels that that helps him in his diplomacy with Indians. So there are complex um, political reasons and also personal reasons why things in the final months of the British Raj begin to change on the ground. But even now, Gandhi refuses 
to engage directly with the media. In 1946, to give you an example, Sardar Patel becomes the uh, Minister of Communications and Information and Broadcasting, actually, in the interim government. So this is before independence. And Patel uh, discusses this with Gandhi. And we do have evidence that I quote in my work. But Gandhi says to Patel in Gujarati, uh, he says, uh, you know, that, you know, I'm not going to engage with this medium because the people I want to reach don't have access to radio in India. These are the poor in the villages and so on. So I'll come, come to this in a moment when I'm concluding. But again, we get an insight into why Gandhi is holding back even at this late stage. This does not mean that Gandhi's speeches are not being recorded now. They are increasingly being recorded, as are indeed other people, other Indians' speeches, and they are being relayed on All India Radio by the British in India. There are Indians, of course, in All India Radio too, but the British are still in charge of policy. And particularly after independence, during the whole crisis with the partition of the subcontinent and so on, we do see Gandhi allowing his messages, his uh, post-prayer speeches, his speeches in Bengal. If you all know, you know, he goes to Bengal, that's where he is when independence occurs. He's not in Delhi. He is allowing broadcasters and broadcast journalists to interview him and also to record his speeches for transmission on All India Radio. But it's only in November, as Johar mentioned at the beginning, that we find Gandhi taking to the airwaves in a live broadcast. And of course, the content of that broadcast on the 13th of November is all about the crisis to do with partition, the dislocation, the communal uh, dangers, and so on. So, you know, he is spreading his message. He's, he's doing it because, as George said, you know, he's not physically able to do, th- do it any other way. So, so that is the second major broadcast. But as I said, you know, it's not as if All India Radio is not now recording his speeches. In fact, in my article, I have a very poignant um, recollection of Mr. Madan, who is one of the All India Radio technicians who is present on the grounds, um, you know, in the grounds of Birla House on that fateful evening, you know, of 30th January, 1948. He's there setting up his mics, waiting, you know, setting up all the recording, um, waiting for Gandhi to come. And he writes about how he's looking at his recording equipment and looking up at Gandhi and watching him coming, you know, just about to set things up when he hears the fatal shots being fired. And actually, just before I, I come to my conclusion, A few days before the the fatal shooting, of course, as you all know, there had been another attempt at a a bomb that was placed near the grounds of Gandhi's Gandhi's prayer meeting in Birla House. And it is very poignant how we do have tapes of, um, of of that moment and of Gandhi trying to pacify the crowds when the bomb goes off, um, telling them to calm down. And it is rather poignant that we do have that recorded because all India radio technicians, you know, were in the grounds. But what I want to do now is perhaps to offer a few concluding reflections when, um, if you'll forgive me, I will look at some of my notes to try and pull some of my ideas together. It is tempting to consider the counterfactual, the success Gandhi may well have enjoyed had he engaged with radio as a social reformer from before the war. Might Gandhi have been able to put his message of rural reconstruction, primary education, and removal of of untouchability, might he have been able to put this across more efficiently? After all, Gandhi, was continually using new media forms throughout his career from the time he was in South Africa when he began using the telegraph so effectively 
right through to 1933 when he established his last new journal, the Haridan. He did that with the similar motive of propagation. So why didn't he do it? When Fielden asked him on one occasion, he replied to Fielden, why should I help a machine which will be used against me? Now, of course, we know in India, the government's control over AIR was markedly different from that exercised over the press. Now, the Raj had quickly realized the fallacy of establishing an official newspaper. It would simply not be taken seriously by anyone, least of all by their own countrymen. And therefore, the Raj found it far more effective to combine indirect persuasion, disguised subsidies to newspapers and Reuters, with fines and legal restrictions, which they enshrined in their press acts, to try and control the print media and to serve and to make it serve imperial interests. Thus, newspapers in India enjoyed a far greater latitude under the Raj because there was no mileage in having a state-controlled press. And because the British had managed over several decades to construct a workable model of persuasion with control. And in the final analysis, endemic mass illiteracy effectively curtailed, they thought, the direct impact of newspapers. But of course, the broadcast model in India was both very new and inherently very different, um, as, of course, the experience of the IBC and EIR demonstrated. Despite having the blueprint of the BBC to work from, the project of private broadcasting as represented by the IBC and public broadcasting as embodied in All India Radio was found to be practically, financially and ideologically incompatible with the ethos of the Raj. The collapse of the IBC in 1930 and its government takeover spelt the death knell for any incipient nationalist aspirations for radio. Bernard Cohn has argued, and several other people too, that the conquest of India was a conquest of knowledge. The Raj bureaucrats were aware of the soft power that control over the mass media would give the imperial state as indeed were their nationalist opponents like Gandhi. Imperial rule depended essentially on a monopoly of information, the acquisition of knowledge and control over its interpretation. Broadcasting, when compared to the press, was far more lethal as a medium of influence as it had a greater reach and it was not impeded by illiteracy. When it appeared that the airwaves over India could potentially spread the contagion of opposition, the Raj took preemptive measures to ensure that the battle between strategic control and freedom of expression was over before a single shot had been fired. Officials, of course, were also aware of the increasing necessity of securing a good press during these years, not least because of the success of their opponents like Gandhi. Though the Raj attempted to censor foreign newspapers and news reports, it was not possible beyond the point to completely suppress this. And this is what uh, helps to explain 
the successful engagement of American journalists with Gandhi. How far can Gandhi's response to radio also be explained by his supposedly techno-skeptic mindset? In his early writings in Hind Swarar, Gandhi had proclaimed all machinery to be bad. And throughout his life, he was confronted by the accusation that, that he was, in quotes, an arch enemy of machines. Also, during a long career, Gandhi was occasionally contradictory. He was inconsistent in both rhetoric and praxis. He notably championed handicraft and manual labor. He often criticized the impact of industrialization. Arguably, Gandhi's belief in the sanctity of human labor, epitomized in the hand-spinning charkha, was also a recognition of the economic realities facing India's rural millions. And I believe is perfectly compatible with his appreciation of modern electronic technology. On one occasion, um, on the 13th of November, actually, on 1947, on All India Radio, he characterized the power of radio as, in his words, Shakti, divine power, which he felt was embodied in the wireless. Further, Gandhi's conceptualization of the impact of machines and technology, as well as his vision of ethical economics, developed over time. You know, it's not static. It became more nuanced and sophisticated. As, you, as he once said to a critic in 1934, and I'm quoting, we do want machines, but we do not want to become their slaves. We should make the machine our slave. I'm paraphrasing. Over a lifetime, I, I believe Gandhi displayed a fascination with technology, with technology, technological innovation from when he first set sail from India to come to England as a teenager. He was really impressed by modern steamship. He marveled at the Suez Canal. He was, uh, you know, he thought the electrification in London was fantastic. Um, and also, I think throughout his life, we see how he uses modern technology to communicate with not just his opponents, but with fellow nationalists. So, you know, using, for example, electric telegrams right from his South African days onwards. Um, I came across a very funny example how in 1944, after he's released from prison, uh, people think that, you know, Gandhi needs to relax and suggest that he should watch a film. You know, he was in, he was in Bombay and, and Gandhi's made, made to watch his first feature film in 1944, but he doesn't really enjoy that experience. Anyway, so, uh, you know, based on my research, one can, I don't think we can accuse Gandhi of being anti-Diluvian and opposed to the cultural modernity represented by radio because of his refusal to interact fully with it. He appeared to follow radio developments in India, and despite coming late to broadcasting in life, he did admire the global reach of wireless technology. Also, he was very happy to interact with individual broadcasters like Dunstan and Fielden, but he was averse to working with the institution of broadcasting under imperial constraints. I think this was in keeping with his general mantra. Gandhi was anti-Raj, not anti the British. Gandhi's reluctance to deliver live broadcasts from a studio may be characterized as idiosyncratic, but that ought not to be confused or conflated with an antipathy to radio. The ultimate aim of broadcasting, as understood by Gandhi, as well as by the BBC, was public service, but in the context of subjugated India, All India Radio was not fit for Gandhi's purpose. The chronic 
paucity of radio sets in India, but particularly in rural India, also convinced Gandhi that he could not reach the people who most needed his help. You know, the toiling masses, the poor, who were all beyond the pale of broadcasting. Gandhi, I believe, remained a utilitarian and technology had to serve a practical purpose within a suitable context. Thus, he exulted in the engineering marvel of the Suez Canal, linking East and West, yet he found the Eiffel Tower in Paris overrated when he visited it for an exhibition in 1890. Evidence in my research suggests that Gandhi approached broadcasting in a similar fashion. But it's true, he also did not incorporate radio into his ideological worldview in the same way that he had print. I think this may well have been simply a matter of timing and access. It may also reflect the advantages that Gandhi saw in the portability and accessibility that the press offered him. Dennis Dalton has argued that Gandhi was, and I quote, not primarily a theorist, but a reformer and an activist. As a politician, Gandhi's interaction with technology was often dictated by pragmatism. Gandhi throughout his life remained shy and ill at ease with other media too, particularly, for example, the camera. Yet the Mahatma was no less a showman for his causes and cognizant of the power of the media to forge anti-imperial identities. He almost instinctively believed in the power of the image. And for instance, someone like Emma Tarlow has demonstrated this in connection with his sartorial choices. But whilst over his image and over the pen, Gandhi could exercise some measure of control over the airwaves, he emphatically did not. Ultimately, I believe what Gandhi's interaction with broadcasting reveals is the necessity to acknowledge that influence of technology is linked to its historic specificity. That is what endows it with an explanatory power. Gandhi's frequent references in his speeches to myriad dialogic forms letters, telegrams, telephone calls, press articles, news agency reports, and laterally also broadcasts, reveals what a consummate communicator Gandhi was and how he continued to have his finger on the pulse of the nation. And thus, for a communicator par excellence, it is perhaps a fitting tribute to Gandhi to have 12th November commemorated as the Jan Prasaran Divas or the Public Service Broadcasting Day as announced by the Indian government in 2000. Yet to live up to the ideals Gandhi sought to propagate of and through the media is clearly proving to be far more challenging. Thank you. Chandrika, that was a lovely talk. And I would come back only for the sake of a little bit of excitement in this whole subject to three markers, to three points of history. First is his speech in 1931 addressed to the American people. Now, let us not forget that America was the first country to be taking steps in broadcasting. In fact, the word broadcasting came from California because uh, the first radio engineer felt that spreading the word around was like what his papa had told him about spreading seeds. So broadcasting comes from a farming lexicon. Okay, Americans were far ahead. And by 1930, he had made his splash through the Dandi March. 
he had chosen a metaphor an item a metaphor i put it salt which meant a lot to the white world that was always starved of salt okay by 31 he was a celebrity to the western world that let us say uh, tagore had been established uh, let us say about 1820 years ago okay he was uh, establishing himself on the international stage so as to internationalize the cause of indian independence so let's move away from 31 31 radio was struggling in india radio was struggling in india 37 This is a more interesting year. Thirty-five, Lionel Fielden comes in. The Dunstan period is over, and Lionel Fielden is one of those over-enthusiastic, hyper-energetic people who must do something. So he begins with a very noble task of cutting the bureaucracy to size, and the bureaucracy retaliates by cutting him to size. So they have a very interesting period, almost similar to what I had uh, encountered. So, but we let that pass. I will let that pass. <laughs> So um, he, he writes that I fight, uh, I fight so frightfully with the deputy secretaries and secretaries. He doesn't know that there are many gods anyway. So thirty-seven is more interesting because Fielden was in complete command. Fielden wanted the nationalists to come on radio. Fielden wanted to challenge the Raj bureaucrats by saying, "I'm going to get them on social messaging. I want to allow them to talk politics. I know I'm a proper British." so he tried and while gandhi was keen to send people like uh, rajkumari amritkar and others in subsequently he avoided now that is a mystery we need to crack yes 1937 at the height of lionel fielden's raj regime sabraj there were only 92000 receiver sets in india mm. there were four stations only with limited beats as you know medium wave could go up to what 200 miles if it was powerful enough short wave could go longer with a crackly voice so we had bombay madras delhi and delhi was just open last year i mean in 36 and calcutta there were two more stations one at lucknow the other in trichy yeah these were the six there were 11 transmitters at that point of time so the reach was limited and the number of sets receiver sets or radio sets as we call it was 92000 gandhi knew it was not worth his while he knew and they were they were speaking four to five languages he knew it was not worth his in 1937 and so if he declined if he gave a lot of advice to brother field and telling him not to take things emotionally these fights happen and things like that he was doing it politely saying like many people said to say to the english uh, television that boss you're not worth my trouble you reach 0.04% of the population so why are we talking about it uh, it's it's good to give feel good with people like us plus sort of gladden us but it's not worth it in politics so in 37 when he was in the height of his politics contesting elections trying to corner the muslim league trying to contest against the hindu mahasabha and winning slashing the muslim league and it's all muslim dominated state he was not going to use the radio but in 47 it was a change scene by then technology had improved number of transmitters had gone up to 18 the sets were better sets were more i think it was about 5 lakhs which is quite a critical mass so i would put it i have read your work that it was his calculation that it was not worth his while having said that he did not ignore the radio as a medium his technophobia did not go to any uncrossable limits he was very clear in where he was get going going at remember it was very expensive you have used the word recording recording on a couple of occasions i would put it like this that they were temporary recordings as you know during that period we don't have too much of archival recording which is a big gap in indian history the Absolutely. period before independence we don't have archival recordings with great difficulty jina speech was found out and presented to pakistan the august 1947 speech was found out 
So we don't have too much because they were all recorded on silver sheets. Yeah. They were done on silver discs and other very expensive medium. Yeah. And these were emolded and reused again and again. So we don't have the recordings of that period. Gandhiji was very clear that it had to be worth his while. That's what I'm saying. But why did he suddenly change in 47? By June 1947, it was clear that Jinnah and Nehru mattered more that they would be leading it. Patel mattered more. And he was taking a voluntary retirement from politics. But he wanted his voice to be heard. Yes. As you said about Noah Khali, during the Noah Khali or the Bengal period, the Bele Ghatta period of 19, yeah. August 47, he wanted his voice to be heard. One way of doing it was to send old age Twitter, which was Telegram which was also fond of using. Limited number of words, expensive, you send it. The other one was to be quoted on radio. He had reached a stage when he considered himself not radio worthy, but quote worthy. He was compelled to go to uh, All India Radio, Kingsway Camp, not on Parliament Street, not near the new Parliament building. No, no. Other not one. near yeah. the new Parliament building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's on Kingsway Camp near Delhi University. Yeah. He was compelled to go there because of riots. And they worshipped that date. That's my way of looking at it. That's my way of looking at it. And uh, by 47, he needed to be in touch with a party that he had hoped to disband itself. When he nurtured the same hope. But he had uh, more or less made up his mind that since... Up to 1945, it didn't matter to him. 46, it didn't matter to him. 47, it's best left to the youngsters. So that's the way I look at his interaction because as you have rightly pointed out, Gandhi was media savvy. Gandhi was politics savvy. Gandhi was success savvy. These are not, these are not faults. These are qualities that make a leader. Uh, he didn't believe at the last stage to have his monkey bath and all that. He kept it all to himself. But he was a great communicator. Yes. And that is the way I look at it. Now, I'd like your reaction to this. Thank you, Johar. If you saw me, I was nodding vigorously while you were talking because I couldn't agree with you more. And I'm very grateful that you brought up some of the details of my of my chapter, you know, where I talk about the things you you know where I couldn't talk about, you know, the, the details about spread of All India Radio, the, the small number of stations, the, the financial problems, and it was essentially running on a shoestring. And I think this in, it's very interesting. I think because what you're suggesting is is also what I have am arguing, which is that really Gandhi. It wasn't anything to do with um, being a technophobe. It was everything to do with being a pragmatist and, and, being, and having so much, so many demands on his time that, you know, that he was willing to meet individuals because he was very kind and he always engaged and he saw himself as a journalist. I'm writing a, a book about this, you know. I think it's really important to recognize uh, that, you know, while we might project onto Gandhi, uh, he himself, at a very fundamental level, saw himself um, very proudly as um, a journalist, you know, as, as, as somebody who was you know, and, and he was very, he was proud of that profession. And I think there is something Victorian about that because he grew up, you know, his ideas about the role of media, including broadcasting, this idea, you know, of the BBC with public service, for example, it's very different, of course, uh, with, with in, in India and so on. Um, but the idea that Gandhi grew up with were all late 19th century ideas, you know, ideas about the, the, the fourth estate, uh, the role of the press, the freedom of the press, you know, the idea of individual liberty and the right to talk about it and express it. And he was fundamentally convinced that uh, the, the, liberal, uh, the liberal imperialists, if you like, um, the British, actually saw eye to eye with him. And to some extent, Gandhi was right. They did. I think they, they, they obviously 
it wasn't as simple as that because the, the empire, you know, was very ambiguous about the whole notion of freedom of the press, particularly uh, when it came to supporting it. It was all very well in Britain, you know, which is why they couldn't do anything in 1931 when Gandhi was in London under their noses broadcasting to America. Uh, but it is very interesting, and I've done, I'm writing about this. Um, it is very interesting that the BBC did not approach Gandhi at this point. You know, it, it, because there were reasons for that, and I can't go into it. But anyway, so the idea is that Gandhi was very, very aware that what he was doing was cocking a finger up at the British. You know, he was there in the capital city, a guest um, of the Raj, and using the, plat using the position of freedom that he could get in London to broadcast. So that goes to the heart of what you were saying too, the idea of um, being a pragmatist, being a communicator par excellence and weighing up his options. What worked best uh, for him, for his message, as much as for, for, for the wider context. And I think you're absolutely right in 1947, and this is my final point, you're right, you're absolutely right. And I do talk about it in my chapter and I'm you know, going to expand on this is that by 1947, Gandhi, though he had taken a step back very publicly, he still wanted to be counted. He still felt he had a message to give. And if you look at the contemporary newspapers, so many of them, Johar, led with Gandhi, even after independence and partition. The lead stories was about, well, what was Gandhi saying? Where was Gandhi? Not necessarily supporting him, you know. I mean, they were they were attacking him too. I mean, there were lots of, for example, comment um, after the refugees started pouring in. For example, in Delhi newspapers and newspapers in the Punjab, who were very critical of Gandhi. You know, there were people being quoted in the newspaper saying, "What the hell, What has Gandhi done for us?" You know, it's because of Gandhi's position um, that we are in this mess. And let's not forget that, uh, you know, ultimately the person who succeeded in murdering him was also a journalist. You know, he had his newspapers. He was, he had uh, been upset by newspaper reports over months of what he thought was Gandhi favoring um, the other side against, as he saw it, his own people. So there is a way in which the fact that Gandhi remains uh, relevant in the press, you know, he's constantly in the media, uh, is linked both to, you know, his own activities, you know, he's protecting himself, but also, I think, because the media still think that he is father of the nation. Thank you for hanging in there and listening to the full conversation. If you liked what you heard, do share it with friends and family. You can also leave us a review or rating on iTunes and Apple Podcasts. The crew behind this podcast is God of Krishna on sound supervision and production with support from S. Saranaraj and Raku Tankaila. Episode artwork and design is by Chandni Venkataraman. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel on your favorite podcast platform. It can also be accessed on our website, bangaloreinternationalcenter.org. This is Lekha Naidu signing off on behalf of everyone at BIC.